So um, let's call up our two authors, Susanna Kersley. Look at that, she's magically appearing. And Diana Gabaldon. And there she is, magically appearing. So Susanna's in Canada, Diana's in California. And the miracle of Zoom is that we can actually do all this, which I think is great. So before we start, ladies, I would like to raise a glass and toast Susanna. It's been quite a while. And in fact, when your last book published, Susanna, I think you were actually at the Poison Pen with Diana. Yep, 2018, it was Bell Letter. yep. In the before times when we could actually- In the before times, before yeah, times. Yeah, live events. <laughs> And I'll be there again in the after times. Thank you. Well, we certainly, we certainly do hope so. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you ladies and um, listen in and really look forward to what you have to say. Thanks. All right. All right. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep, I can totally hear you. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, I can't hear myself with the, the earbuds in. Oh, okay. That's better. All right. <laughs> Okay, well, congratulations, Susanna. This is wonderful. And Thank so nice you. to see you again, even if not in the flesh. I know, it's really nice to see you too. I've been looking forward to this so much. Yeah, yeah, well, I enjoyed the book immensely and so forth. And I was wondering what led you to uh, to Scotland, as it were, especially Jacobites. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> things like the Act of Union and so forth. I mean, I understand the appeal. <laughs> right. Have you got anybody to pay you to write about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the... I actually started off, I mean, The Winter Sea, I think, was the first time that I yes, it was. that I wrote about Jacobites. And that was just chance. That was really just stumbling on on one little history book that that was about the Franco-Jacobite invasion attempt of 1708 mm -hmm. and realizing I I'd, I'd never heard about it before, I never yeah. learned about it before. And then I the more I read about it, the more I started wondering why we never heard about it and why we never learned about it. And and the that sort of led me down that whole rabbit hole of of um you know the 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 earlier jacobite invasions that that are not covered so much in the in the history books and through that i i discovered the the murray family of Abercarney. um and once i discovered the murray family of Abercarney and john murray who became the hero of of the winter sea and his brothers and his cousins and uh, Colonel Patrick Graham, who was his uncle, and, and all these real life characters um, just kind of stepped off the pages of my research and became very real people to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, they, their real life adventures kept leading me into more and more research, which kept leading me into more and more story ideas. That's um, kind of how it works, yeah. It's, that's pretty, yeah, I, I'm sure you're really familiar with that. And um, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so I had written The Winter Sea, and then Colonel Graham himself wouldn't stop talking in my head which I'm you know it, it, and so that led me into a book called The Firebird which carried on into the, the Jacobites into Russia but again Ooh, I hadn't realized I yeah. hadn't realized I had a, a whole community there um but the the vanished days was really uh it the the sort of germ of the idea started when I um found out that Colonel Graham it was it was again doing research on that family and finding out that Colonel Graham had applied to uh to collect the wages that were owed to his son, Jamie, um, uh -huh. who had uh -huh. sailed with the Darien expedition, um, which again was something I hadn't known about that, that, um, that in 1699, 1698, 1699, the Scots had done this amazing venture to found their own colony in what is now Panama. Uh -huh. And they had, um, it was a brilliant idea, fascinatingly brilliant idea uh, to sure. to establish right. yeah to establish a colony where they would bring ships in on the Atlantic side and carry the cargoes across land to ships that were waiting on the Pacific side. And by doing that, they would sort of cut out the trade of the mm -hmm. the English East India Company and the Dutch East India Company and all these other mm -hmm. competitors. And of course, King William, who was both Dutch and the King of England. Um, didn't think that was such a great idea. So he he undermined their efforts all the way through. Um, and um, so the, that was a fascinating episode of history and the collapse of that venture, which was engineered, you know, deliberately engineered by the king, um, was what led to, in large part, the, the Treaty of Union. Um, and 
because it bankrupted Scotland. It, yeah. it just, you know, it, 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 and, and um, so it was that sort of tumble of events that, that, and finding out that Colonel Graham had had a son involved in that, that led me down another rabbit hole that I thought, well, this would be a good, this would be a good subject for a book. And it lets me continue on with my Abercairney people and, and um, you know, so that's kind of where that starts. It all starts with a, you know, a, a, a what person. if and a, yeah. a person that you want to follow. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. That's exactly right. It all comes down to character. Yeah. So currently, I'm doing a, a Surrey panel this year with the uh, with the topic. You know, what comes first, character or plot? And, and what is it? Is it characters for you? That come, it's it's characters. Always, characters, always yeah. characters. Yeah. It's always characters. I mean, the plot is what the characters do. So you can't have a plot right. if you don't know who's doing it. <laughs> but I, for me, I never know. I never know the plot until the characters start moving. I think it's exactly. the same for you. Like yeah. until like you can yeah. think you know certain plot points that they're going to hit, but they may or may not yeah. know, <laughs> they may or may not hit those points, right? You may yeah. think that this might this would be a good thing for them to do. And then they get there and they're like, yeah, no, we're just going to go over here and do this other thing. And and it's it's creating, well, creating seems like a very grandiose way to put it. It's putting the characters on the page. Exactly. and letting them go and then following them and seeing what they do yeah no that's exactly how it works for me i gather yeah. there are actually people who will draw up a plot and then try to people it with yeah. characters and i mean i read some books that were clearly written on those lines yeah uh, but, you know if that's how you want to do it that's fine but you know yeah no for me it's always character yeah. you know once in a while i get asked to go and teach at uh writing as such uh you know basically just to tell people the, the elementary school and high school kids what is it like to be a writer you know what do you, what do you actually do how do you make any money at this etc and so i just end up telling them everything about publishing and all the things you could do besides writing and so forth but it gets down to how do you write a story i said okay for me it always starts with the person the story is about so let's pick somebody who is the story about okay if we're talking fairy tales let's have it be a woodcutter you know who is this woodcutter? What's his name? They get a name for him. I say, okay, what's he going to do? Well, he's a woodcutter. He's obviously going to go cut wood, right? So he's walking down the path into the forest and he finds a tree and he cuts it down. Okay, what happens next? A fairy pops out of it and it denounces him for cutting down her tree. <laughs> and, you know, and after that, it's, and then what happens? And then yeah, what happens? and that's that's how a story is exactly, exactly. how a story is built. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes when you're writing like a real life historical character, you know some of the things that happen mm -hmm. next, but you you don't know. There are big gaping holes that you don't exactly. know what happens next. And it's your knowledge of that character through what they've left behind. Like in the case mm -hmm. of, um, um, you know, John Murray or his brother Robin, who is in this book, his mm -hmm. real life brother, older brother Robin, who left behind a lot of letters and documents that I was able to access. I know some of the things that Robin was doing, but I don't know other things. I know some of his dialogue because he, in some of his, his documents, he actually wrote conversations that he had, which are fabulous. He, he actually, you know, there's a speech that he gives to, to my hero, Adam, um, when he is, he's asked to do something that goes against his moral character and he gives a very indignant speech back and it's almost word for word what he wrote at the time and it's kind of nice to be able to put that back you know on the page for him but so I know some of the things that he didn't said but then there are other holes it's it, where I don't know what he was doing so it's your knowledge of his character and what he would have done and might have done you know that you that you yeah. just sort of fill in that's kind of fun it's like yeah. a like a puzzle it's like piecing a puzzle I love puzzles right so it's mm -hmm. kind of Likewise. like yeah yeah yeah. Exactly. And that, of course, is why we do research, because that's where we get the frame of the puzzle. Right. You get to design the pieces. Then you get the pieces and then you can, you know, then you kind of squish that last little piece mm -hmm. in sometimes. Sometimes yeah. there's a hole left, but, you know, yeah, I remember like somebody say, saying, somebody said once that historians, like historian historians get to leave bigger holes because they can mm -hmm. just jump, right? They can just say that, you know, that, that a, a, you know, follow the facts and say that people were able to last, you know, on a journey if they were going across America with limited supplies that they made it across America with limited supplies and the journey mm -hmm. took three days and stuff. They don't, they don't have to explain how, you know, but, uh -huh. but in a story, you can't do that. It's a gaping mm -hmm. plot hole. So you have to fill in how that happened and who helped them and who came along and did what and how they made those supplies last for, you know, a limited amount of time, you know, so it's, it's, it's an interesting thing for a novelist to have to work with. 
I play so, yeah. But it is kind of a treasure trove when you deal with uh, obscure people and you find letters and uh, journals and things like that. On the other hand, when you're dealing with more public figures, there's a lot more of their actual speech you know, kept in the historical record. But you know, that uh, suffers as then from the bias of inclusion, you know, who chose what to write down about what they said. Who kept what, and, and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you're also dealing with like, you know, descendants of the, the, the more public figures who don't want their, their ancestor to be portrayed in a certain way. And I'm very fortunate with the, the Murrays that, um, the Abercarney Murrays and the, and the Inchbrakey Grahams, um, <laughs> both of whom, uh, like their descendants, are just absolutely wonderful. The Abercarney Murrays still live on Abercarney um, and um, actually have a have a link to to um, uh, Outlander, which I can't can't. It's it's a secret link to Outlander, but I can't tell you. Um, but they the um, the but they the the Abercarney Murrays still live there and and you know right where my characters walked and everything and they and they also now own Inchbrakey the the, oh. the estate of Inchbrakey and um, you know so I've been able to go there I've been able to stay there they've been absolutely wonderful they've shared um, mm -hmm. you know documents they've let me see the portraits of everybody so I, I the characters have become even more real than they they were before mm -hmm. and um, but they are you know they just they haven't limited me in any way. They haven't said, oh, well, you have to make them this kind of character. You have to make them that kind of character. Or don't do this. They just, they're, luckily, everything I find about their ancestors, they were all really good people. They weren't, you know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't turned over any terrible rocks yet. You know, they, they've got, you know, they've got a couple of scoundrels in there. Everybody's got a couple of scoundrels, but they've got some fascinating people in their background. So the, you know, lots of fodder there for, I'm not done with the family yet. Got a lot more, lot more family members oh, yeah. to go. Oh, yeah. So some good stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. yeah. Well, I'm happy to say that I get along well with the present uh, people who hold the title of uh, Lord Lovett <laughs> and, That's uh, nice. and yeah. the Earl of of, uh, of uh, Castle Loud. Let's see, the Earl of Crummerby is his actual title, but he uh, he owns Castle Loud, which bears a very strong resemblance resemblance to Castle Rock. And he is, in fact, the head of his branch of Clan Mackenzie. So, nice. Yeah. So luckily, none of them have ever registered any uh, any objections to what I chose to write about their ancestors. This may be due to the Were you ancestors. nervous at all before you first met them? Were you nervous when you first? Slightly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I didn't know how they would take it, but uh, both of them were enthused, luckily, and. Uh, and in fact, the Earl of Cromarty, who's now, now a friend, invited me and Doug to come and stay at the castle. They were about to renovate it for uh, tourism purposes. And so we drove out and stayed with them for two days. That was, that was quite an experience. But you have lovely people uh, from the Earl and his, his countess and so forth at their castle was had obviously not been renovated since about the late 15th century. Right. And while they were about to start, they had a government grant who's showing us the holes in the in the lead plate roof and wondering how he was going to fix those. So forth. But yeah, no, we got along extremely well. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it was it was similar for me because I never approached I never approached the the Laird of Abercarney because I was afraid that, you know, because you're 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 writing about their their yeah. forebear and you're kind of like exactly. what if they what if they think who is this little Canadian upstart writing about my family and you know but what had happened was on on Facebook one day because I'm always looking for something to do on Facebook I'm very bad at posting on Facebook and and but I guess it doesn't matter today but you know <laughs> on Facebook I was having a really terrible time and I I noticed that Abercarney was still operating as an estate and that they were doing weddings. And I, I thought, oh, well, my, my readers would really like this. So I, I, I sort of took that and I posted it up and I said, oh, well, if you, if you like the Winter Sea and John Murray, then you might want to follow, you know, Matt Abercarney. And I, I, I posted it up. I thought they're done and dusted. I'm just my post for the day. And, yeah, and I went to bed. I didn't think anything of it. And I guess overnight they got a lot of followers and, and, and everybody on my post was, was sort of saying oh I love John Murray I love the winter sea it's my favorite book and and they were probably wondering who it what 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 is going on and, and then a couple of days later I got a little message a little private like ping message you know and it was like hello Susanna you know that, that my name is 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 Daniel and and uh, 
you know, my wife is Anna Murray and she is a direct descendant of William Murray, who was John Murray's brother. And I'm like, oh, darn. You know, <laughs> you know, it's just, and uh, we've read your book, The Winter Sea, and, and, and they, it turned out they liked it, thankfully. Oh, and, and that started this, and, and they are very interested in family history as well, oh, and the history yeah. of the family and of that mm -hmm. period. And mm -hmm. so they've been nothing but helpful. And every time I go there, they, you know, they and their children just, you know, I'm, I'm loaded into the car and I'm driven wherever I want to go and, and all these places I would never have thought of going. And, and I get taken around a lot of, um, now, now every time I go, you know, we'll be going out to, to various battle sites and everything and looking for different things and everything we're going by now is, oh, well, you know, the Outlander was filmed over here and Outlander was filmed over there and this church they used for the Outlander for something. And it's, it's, it's really quite funny. And everybody was very impressed that I knew you. They were extremely impressed up in that, up in that section of Perthshire that, you know, I, but, uh, it's, uh, it's beautiful countryside, absolutely beautiful countryside. So. I keep looking now on the on the show. It's like I know that church. I know that church. I know what scene happens there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, they can only film within ninety miles of you know where the studio is. That's right. You know, one day's journey there and back for all of the trucks that you need to take in order to film anything. Yeah. Uh, they had asked. Uh, well, the, the castle people at Castle Loud had asked, right. you know, could they maybe come and film at Castle Loud? And I said, I'll suggest it to them, but I don't think so. Anyway, they said, well, no, he's way up in Dingwall. No, there's no way we could get up there. So, so they built Castle Loud instead, or borrowed Castle Moon. There's that beautiful little church at Tippermore that, um, yeah, yeah. you know, where the battlefield is and everything mm -hmm. where that they used. And it's just, well, it's, it's nice. It's nice for the tourism of the area as well. Oh, so. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really fun. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Have you contributed to Scottish tourism? Do you know? I, I don't actually. Well, I, th I think carry people. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, uh, I, I think a lot of people have gone. I get, a, I, I get an astonishing number and a, a gratifying number of um, emails from people and private messages from people that have made it up to Cruden Bay and okay. Aberdeenshire okay. for uh, mm -hmm. the winter sea seem to resonate with a lot of people that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so people send me messages saying, you know, I'm here in Cruden Bay and, you know, having sticky toffee pudding at the St. Olaf Hotel and, you know, do, doing all these things, having a pint at the Killy. And so it, it's, it's, it's kind of nice. So I, I, I'm doing my little part, my little part. And for the Vanish Days, um, there, the action takes place in a, a real life National Trust building um, oh. that I renamed for the, it's, it's actually Gladstone's land on the Royal Mile. But yeah. I called it Caldo's Land. So I, they have Obviously. holiday flats there. Um, really? And I stayed in the, the flats for like a few years running. So not continually, but I went back again and again and again mm -hmm. um, into the same flat. Um, and it was really neat. But the first time I did it, it was fun because um, it seems like a really good idea the first time you do it. You think, oh, this is fabulous. This is like this, you know, 15th century building, the 16th mm -hmm. century building um in the royal mile and it's it's one of those old little tiny narrow narrow turdy houses and and uh it's a you know tenement going straight up and, and they've got it made into a beautiful museum on the well at that time it was like two floors with museum and now i think they've done the the third floor and uh and then the rest is holiday little holiday flats that the renting of the holiday flats helps fund the, the property. Um, so I thought, well, I'll stay in the holiday flat and then I'll, I'll be writing in the building that I'm researching and setting the book in. That's a great cool. idea. Yeah, yeah great. It, it, which seems like a fabulous idea until the museum closes at like 5 p.m. and everybody leaves and you're there by yourself in this like 16th century building in the middle of the Royal Mile in the dark by yourself because uh, there was nobody uh, else in any of the holiday flats except there. me. And it was uh, a little spooky. But yeah. yeah. But I can, I, I'm here to tell you that if there are any ghosts in Gladstone's land, they're entirely friendly because nothing bothered me the whole time I was there. So I saw one mouse and no ghosts and, and everything was lovely. And they have a, like the, up, up, getting up to the um, holiday flats, there's a, an old stone turnpike stair. And, you know, it's just, it's just a beautiful place. But anybody that wants to get a feel for what that place is like, you can actually go to the, the setting. And 
um, when I was staying there, I went down one level into the museum and walked into the museum and one of the portraits on the wall looked really, really familiar. And it turned out it was uh, Captain Gordon, Captain Thomas Gordon, who is one of the characters in the book. Yeah, so I thought, well, that's definitely the right place to be writing about. Yeah, you bet. So, yeah. But it's, yeah, it's well, just a stone's throw from the castle. So it's a good place to stay. It is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, one of the other things that I like so much about your books, and it's also research-based, is that you know so much about the actual laws of the period and how they would apply. And you use one of the good effect, you know, with the, the, the woman trying to get her her husband's, you know, her essentially post-mortem benefits, but not right. being able to prove he was dead. Yeah, or not it being was, able to prove she'd been married to she'd been married to him. Yes. Yeah, because yeah. it was just tricky. It's 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 not it wasn't easy. And it was a it was a difficult thing because the that was one of the things that the English did um, just after the union happened in the spring of of uh, 1707. There was a lot of unrest in Edinburgh because it had been kind of snuck in sneakily this union. Um, uh, and there were a lot of people not happy about it. And mm -hmm. the the English sent up the equivalent money, it was called the equivalent. And it was designed to pay off a whole lot of things, mm -hmm. um, mostly the, the lords who had voted for the union in parliament. Yeah. But but it was also, the, the story was that it was designed to pay off, you know, a lot of different things. Um, mm -hmm. But they were paying the wages as well that were owed to the sailors that had died mm -hmm. uh, in the Darien expedition. So people had to come forward and, cl and claim them and say that you were, mm -hmm. you know, you were the rightful heir of soldier X mm -hmm. or, or sailor X. And uh, the, the company of Scotland that had, that had um, been behind the, the venture had kept very meticulous records and the sailors and soldiers who had gone on the expedition had left, um, you know, little, uh, receipts before they went saying who their heir was going to be so you just had to kind of match up with that that thing but it, there were occasional cases where there was no um, proper receipt or where the person had you know left a receipt and then uh, you know someone else came forward and said well I'm I'm his wife and so, yeah it doesn't match up so there were always these cases of people coming forward and pretending to be someone they weren't and uh, there were you know, there were there were forgeries and, and you know famous forgeries and stuff coming forward. And um so that that was a something I uncovered in in um just researching you know different things, scandals. People were talking about it in their correspondence back and forth to each other, saying, yeah. you know, so and so was was in prison for forgery and coming forward and doing this. So it became it became and and of course John's brother all this time was quite conveniently in jail. In Edinburgh, for, for, uh, you know, not really. He didn't really do anything. He was just be, he was just taken up because the the authorities wanted John. So they, they were trying to get John. He was bait. Yeah. He was bait. yeah, it was pretty much bait. Um, so that all seemed again like a really good, good yeah. germ of a story for me. Exactly. To, that lets you look into things suddenly. Yeah. Something comes along and it just falls in. It does. Starts, it it does. Yeah. Hello, Barbara. Barbara Hi. Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, yes. One of which is that this book is called by your wonderful publisher, Source Books, the third in the Scottish series. And we've talked about the Winter Sea, but Diana and I were trying to remember last week when she was signing, you know, hundreds of yes. books um, for Outlander fans. We were trying to remember the title of book two. Um, which okay. I now know so, is okay. called the Firebird. But well, series series are bit? okay. So series are tricky things because series to me are constructs of other people, right? Mm -hmm. Unless I mean, like Diana controls her own series. Like she mm -hmm. she sets, you know, the she knows the order of her books and she makes them the way she wants them. I write books and people configure them into series. And what happened was I wrote the Winter Sea. And then I wrote what I called a sort of sequel to the Winter Sea, mm -hmm. which was Firebird, because Firebird had different, I write dual time stories for, you know, like so Firebird had had different modern day characters, but the same historical characters. It just continued the historical story. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a true sequel sequel. It was like a sort of sequel 
sort of companion novel. And you could read them in order or you could read them out of order, whichever way you wanted to. But on Goodreads, where readers like to put things in category, you know, readers like to categorize things and, and put them properly on their bookshelf a certain way so they know how to find them. They created a series called the Slains series because Slains Castle featured in both things. So that was a reader construct, it wasn't me. So they said, so startling. <laughs> yeah, so they called it the Slains series. And I don't interfere with what readers do. So no, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, you know, that's that's the readers wanted to call it the Slain series. It was the Slain series. Mm -hmm. So this book I call The Vanished Days is a sort of prequel sort of companion book mm -hmm. um, because it has overlapping action with the Winter Sea. It, part of it happens in 1707. It's a dual time, but the present day is in both both sections are in the past. There's no modern day timeline. So, right, so like both sections are in the past. Um, the, the one section is in 1707, taking part at the same time as a lot of the action of the Winter Sea with a lot of the same characters. I mean, like Colonel Graham is weaving, he's mentioned weaving in and out. Um, part of it goes backwards and you see some of the characters that you're later gonna see in the Winter Sea and the Firebird and stuff like John. Um, John's brothers, John's cousins. Um, so there is, there are connections. So it's a sort of companion book, like, you know, it, there's, there are connections, um, but it's not a straight prequel and it's not a straight, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't come like one, two, three straight order, <laughs> no. but it's written, you know, I wrote it You're after. Yeah. So my publisher, my publisher has decided that because Slains isn't in it, they're going to retitle the whole thing, the Scottish series. And since this is the third one they're publishing, they're calling it number three in this. So I just, I just stay out of it. I just write the books because, because technically you could I mean, like I would, I would argue that a Desperate Fortune is like a satellite book of the Scottish series, that, yeah. right? Because that. Anna, Anna, who is in the Firebird mm -hmm. and sort of the Winter Sea, um, is in, yeah. like she makes yeah. an appearance in A Desperate Fortune. Um, the Vanished Days has links to Bellwether. The Van like, you know, so it, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard with my books though, because I, I don't intend for this to happen, but mm -hmm. What happens with my characters is once they, once they're on the page, I don't really have any, con or off the page, they, I don't have any control over what they do. Right. And mm -hmm. it, I mean, I, Diana understands me. <laughs> they just, <laughs> they just, they just are, they're wandering around so back are, in yeah. here somewhere. Right. And I'll be writing another book. And what happens is they just wander back in and, mm -hmm. um, there's a character in this book called Gilroy. And I was literally, he came into this, the book and he started doing his thing. And I was, I, I was several chapters into the book before I finished out or before I figured out where he connected in my, you know, Susanna verse where he, I was like, Oh, you know, I know who his parents are now. I know where he comes from. And, and, but it took me that long to figure out where he came from. So one day somebody, and it's, I know it's going to be a reader and not me because there's no way my mind would be able to do this, but some, some reader is going to do one of those boards with yarn and figure <laughs> out where all my characters go yeah. mm -hmm. and what books they wander into and, and, and everything. Um, it's, um, but so the Scottish series, the Slain series, whatever you want to call it, these three books are connected to each other but you don't have to read them in any order. That's right. They're not a, they're not what I, it's not like, it's not like the Outlander series where you really do want to start at the beginning and build all the way through because, you know, it's, that's like, Outlander is like building a castle. It's, you want to start with the bare ground and build, build up through the foundation and, and, you know, and then start, putting on the ornamentation and you know it's 
otherwise you don't know what the shape of, of what you're looking at is mm -hmm. and it's whereas with mine it's like you can walk over here and pick this rock up and just look at it and you know it, it's it's not going to affect the other rock it's more like reading yeah. Anthony Trollope it's just you're all in one big village and the characters are going to walk into mm -hmm. to so one house exactly. or another house right so right well I love your answer but in truth I asked that for a really mundane reason which is I just thought that people who were not new to your work <laughs> would like to know there are other books <laughs> that you might like to read my personal acquaintance with Susanna and still my favorite book and it is The Shadowy Horses, which takes place in Northern England. And at that time, Susanna's books were published in the UK, not here in the US. And we used to import them, um, a lot of them. And I kept thinking, you know, at first I hadn't read it. And I began to wonder why we were selling so many copies of this amazing book. So I did read it and I'm not gonna spoil it for any of you, but Susanna does the same thing that I really approve of uh, in the shadowy horses that you don't often meet in historical fiction. Um, I love it. It's a missing Roman legion. We're in the North of England. It has nothing to do with what we're really talking about here, but what a great book. And all of her books are wonderful. Um, dragons were in Wales, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, she tours us all around. Now, my other question, which I really wanted to ask you, um, I'm familiar with Diana's writing process, which is, I like to think unique to Diana. Diana probably likes to think it's unique to Diana. Yep. Um, and it involves um, writing scenes and then working out connective tissue and eventually yep. figuring out a shape. She can describe it better than I can. Yep. But uh, Susanna, you know, are you a more linear writer? Do you, do you, I, this is a question that I know people are going to ask, so it's just easier to ask it now. Do you begin at the beginning and kind of motor to the end, or do you have a more, um, do things just sort of happen and you piece them together? I'm a, I'm a mix. I'm oh. not as, I don't have the the kaleidoscope, I, I would say I don't have the kaleidoscope that, that Diana has going on, um, but I do get pieces. I, I have the puzzle. We both have this sort of puzzle. Um, the puzzle analogy is great, you know, where you find the edges and then you're filling in the middle. I get the first line first. Um, that's when I know I have a book. I'll start to see the characters first. Um, it's usually I see the characters first and and I don't quite know where they fit. And then I get a first line. And when I get a first line, I get the voice of whoever's speaking that first line. And then they just start talking more and I start taking notes. And sometimes the scene that I'm seeing is not the first scene of the book. Um, the first line usually is. It's close to the first part of the book. Um, the in in this case the first line was the very first line of the book but the but sometimes it's like midway down the first page or in the first chapter or whatever but the um the what'll happen is that i'll, I'll sometimes get a, a scene intact that that belongs towards the end of the book and i know that it's going to happen towards the end of the book but i don't know how i'm going to get there so i just write it down and stick it away and and write towards that but I tend to write linearly towards that and then just sort of leave it over here um if I get stuck I just take a bath or go for a walk or you know do anything I, I don't tend to jump around in the writing because I've with my mind what usually happens is something will come out of the the next something like I don't um the next scene comes out of the scene that I'm writing now. And if I if I jump too far ahead, the scene won't be the same. The development won't be the same. So it's just, the, I, I, I guess my stories develop more like movies in that way, but sometimes I see a preview and, you know, or I see a, a like a, a teaser, a trailer the, of some scene that I don't know quite what's gonna happen yet. It's, it's like a, you know, when you're looking at, at things for or like a TV series and they show you a little glimpse of what's going to happen next week and you don't quite know what the whole show is going to be yet, but you know that you're going to get there. 
that's kind of what my process is like. It's very yeah, visual. I shouldn't, have, yeah. I shouldn't have spoken for you, but I was trying to introduce a little background there. Sarah, yeah. do you want to mention briefly your own process? Who, me? Yes. Briefly. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's a horrible joke. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's neat. It's neat. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. Uh, no, essentially, I don't work with an outline and I don't write in a straight line. I write where I can see something happening. And what I need to write on any given occasion is what I call a kernel, which is a, a visual image, a line of dialogue, a scrap of music, an emotional ambiance, anything that I can see or sense concretely, and especially one that comes with words. You know, if I think of a phrase or description or a line of dialogue while I'm thinking of this, then that's where I start, it's with that. And uh, so I write that down and I just throw a stare at it. And I start fixing it up, you know, moving clauses around, uh, replacing the adjectives, taking out the adjectives, putting in an adverb. I love adverbs. And, uh, and, you know, generally messing around with it. And meanwhile, the back of my mind is picking up questions like, um, where are we? Where is the light coming from? What time of day is it? Who else is in the room? That sort of thing. And one of those questions is going to sort of bring it to life and I can write the next line. <laughs> so it just proceeds by this little sort of, you know, it's not exactly a dribble, but, you know, a continuing uh, gradient, let's say, of idea and, and dialogue and so forth. And, you know, when you can hear the people talking, then, you know, it gets much easier. Yeah. But it, it's, it's like that. It's like I, when I stop, it's because I, I don't, I can't see. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. like to me that's what when I get blocked it's because I don't know what I'm looking at um I'm I'm blind in the book and um I find those are the places where I need to go do more research because I'm I'll, I'll be literally almost standing in the middle of a field or standing in the middle of the street and it's like I or at, at a table and looking down at a plate going I, do, I don't know what I'm looking at and I, mm -hmm. I have to go find out and that um and I'm very I'm very um I'm very tactile. I like to have my like a, this is my this is my fidget widget. This is um this is this is um this is in the book for anybody that's reading the book now. Yeah. Um those are that belongs to Captain Gordon. Um and these actually do come from Leith in they're from the mid 1600s. So you can look back and see those. And then I have I like to have the actual thing around me, so I will show you something that I'm not going to explain what it is, but you will see it later on in the book as well. Mm -hmm. So I have this as well. Let's try to get it closer so you can see. But I have Gorgeous. that as well. So, you know, I, I like to have my little things and I like to hold them and feel them while I'm working. And sometimes I get, you know, inspired by just holding this the stuff as well. So. Well, we all know since Diana is going to be reading from it, uh, what her next published book will be, which will be publishing in November, the end of November, all goes well. But Susanna, before we switch to uh, reading from bees, what is it you're working on next? Because we're just getting to vanish days here, but you know yeah. that's a process that you completed some time back. So I'd like to November the readers yeah. with the hope that there's a work in progress. Oh, yeah, there's always a work in progress. It just takes me a long time. Um, but the um, I am working right now. I'm not ready to, to I'm way not ready to, to let go of my Murray's and my Graham's. Um, so instead of going forward with them, I am going backward with them. Um, and I am taking them back to 1612 um to uh the year that uh well king james the um the sixth and first Perfect. is on the throne um and his son prince henry uh who was king charles the first's older brother has just died under mysterious circumstances and prince henry's closest um companion closest servant was in real life sir david murray of gorthy who was an abercairney murray and um he was also a poet and my um so my my hero in the book is a is a created hero um andrew logan who is being sent up, he's a messenger, he's one of the King's messengers, which was a, a group of men. They're still around, the King's messengers. Um, there can only be so many of them. 
and they they are a, one of the oldest branches of the the service and they they carry the the king's messages and and they also were the people that were sent to apprehend people as well so he is being sent up from london to scotland to fetch back sir david to london um and things are not going to go as planned um because they never do with an Abercrombie murray and um and uh, that's where we start but i you know i can tell you that uh andrew logan is a forebear of one of your favorite characters barbara who is robbie from uh the shadowy horses um, That's wonderful news, Susanna. So, and for those of you who are wondering what you're going to read while Susanna is writing this book, I want to recommend an author that Diana and I both really, really enjoy, Dame Denise Mina, who has mm. just written an astonishing book called Rizio, which oh, yeah. um, takes you back to Mary Queen of Scots when she was married to Lord Darnley, who's a real um, um, I won't say a bad word here, but nonetheless, that's who he is. Yeah. And she's pregnant. And there is a really terrible murder in Holyrood Castle. And uh, it's just, it's a wonderful book. So that's something you could read to kind of prep yourself for what well, Susanna has to say. Right? That is actually, King James once said that that was, that murder was the reason that he um, grew up with his, his um, fear of, but not fear of, but his dislike of, of, blades right. knives because of the murder of Rizio and I will leave it to you to, to discover it. why oh I'm sorry Susanna uh, um, I've been asked to repeat it her name is Denise Mina M-I-N-A and the book is called Rizio R-I-Z-Z-I-O because the murder victim is David Rizio who was um, a uh, companion to Mary Queen of Scots 